Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Good. Good evening. Hi, Vika. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to session two of Restoring Liberty, America as a Self-Governing Nation. So I'm really glad to have you with us tonight, and we are going to be taking another step forward in our discovery of God's hand in our history as a nation. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the heritage that you have given us in Christ Jesus, that our roots go deep down into your word, and we're so blessed by that. We're also blessed to be uh, citizens of the United States of America, and what a privilege to be able to 
discover your plan, your purpose for this nation and its founding, and what a responsibility we have, Lord, to shepherd that vision uh, that our forefathers had for having a nation that would bring biblical principles to bear in every sphere of life. I pray that you would bless our time with this session, Lord, that you would enlighten our understanding, help us to be able to think governmentally, but most of all, Lord, that we would think your thoughts, that you would guide our uh, conversation, Lord, and our questions and answers, and all of it, that you would be glorified. So we commit this to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and begin. Uh, right off, I would like to remind you about this book that was recommended to uh, accompany this short course. It's a thin book, but it has some wonderful, wonderful things in it. Tonight, we're going to be covering uh, probably up to page 27 in this book. It's, uh, we're not going to go through a page by page, but the issues that we're speaking about tonight, you'll be able to, if you haven't already done so, go back and read through those pages and it should confirm the things that we're discussing tonight. Then next week, we will uh, do pretty much the rest of the book. There's a little bit at the end that we'll do in the fourth session, but next week will be the heart of this book as we really get into uh, America's founding and the founding documents and so forth. So uh, I think you will enjoy it. It uh, is a, one of the many treasures that we have in Principal Approach Education. Uh, most of these things have been preserved by the Foundation for American Christian Education. And there's a wonderful library down in Chesapeake, Virginia, where they have uh, an original Webster's 1828 Dictionary and just many uh, wonderful books that were written hundreds of years ago uh, that they've preserved in their library. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that on the, the last night when we discuss the implications and the imperative of principal approach education. Uh, I do have a question though. Uh, I don't know if any of you had ordered these books because two of them came in the mail without any instruction other than my name and I know I didn't order them so I thought well maybe somebody from the class did so if not or if any of you that are watching you ordered well the, your books are here just send me an email and we'll make sure you get them okay all right let's go ahead and begin uh, first of all, by looking, what are our objectives for this session tonight? First of all, to recognize God's hand in America's founding. We're going to be thinking from cause to effect. And I want you to keep that in your mind as we go through all of these sessions, that that's what we're trying to train our minds to always do. Because for every effect or every result, there has to be some cause, something that initiated that or yielded that. And so if we begin to think that way, and if we train our children to think that way, it could really clear up a lot of the fuzziness in our lives, especially in today's world when uh, people don't really follow that consistent thinking from cause to effect. But we'll get to that in a moment. The second uh, objective for tonight is to identify America's place in God's unfolding plan for humanity. America does have a place on Christ his story's timeline just as every other nation does and we want to discover and affirm what God's plan for America is. Uh, one of the main reasons is because we're Americans and we really need to know uh, where God has planted us. We need to understand it. The third objective for tonight is to trace the flow of liberty for the individual from the spiritual sphere, which we say is the internal arena, to the civil sphere, external. There again, we are actually moving in the same direction as cause to effect, because almost always, almost exclusively in Scripture, we see that same pattern of going from internal to external. I can only... Think of one instance that I've found when that is reversed uh, for a specific reason. There are probably others, but uh, generally 
cause to effect. That's, that's how God put us together. Uh, he is what we call the first cause. Uh, there's a wonderful book written by Henry Morris a uh, good many years ago now, but we've used it here in our science courses uh, talking about science. And the first chapter, I believe we talked about this last week, uh, was about theology, theology being the queen of the sciences. But in the introduction, it talks about looking at uh, being able to logically go back to through all the different causes of the effects that we see around us. And finally, you arrive at a place where you've got to come to the first cause. It just doesn't go on forever with some other cause, another cause, another cause. Eventually, you get to the place where it's the first cause, and that first cause is capitalized because it's God. God is the first cause of everything we see. Nothing that we see and experience in this universe happened by itself, happened by chance. It all comes from God. He is the beginning point. So that's where we're heading tonight. You can uh, give me a grade at the end to see, did we meet our objectives by the end? That's what I tell our teachers. You should always go back and ask the students, all right, how'd I do today? Did we meet the objectives? So here are some basic assumptions that we are carrying with us into this session. These assumptions are part of our philosophy, part of our worldview. We talked about that a lot last week. And so one of the assumptions that we bring in is that true liberty for the individual and for nations cannot be obtained or sustained apart from the giver of liberty, Jesus Christ. So when we talk about liberty, we're not talking about some superficial, I get to go do whatever I want, whenever I want, because I, it pleases me and I have the freedom to do it. We're talking about true liberty that can only come from Christ. And once we uh, come into relationship with Jesus Christ, that's when true liberty is opened up and then he gives us the desires of our heart. So we win-win in that because our desires begin to align more and more with him because he knows us. He put us together. He knows what will truly bless us and what will bring glory to his father and they are one and the same. So we're on that journey to get to that place and uh, you can see that I'm sure in your lives as especially those of you who have traversed uh, this uh, earth for a while, you can see how your desires have changed and are aligning more and more with God. That's the Holy Spirit sanctification in us, and I'm so thankful for it. The second one is God has ordained the development of nation states as his governmental structure on earth for fulfilling his purposes in this present age. So we have these nation states, we're used to that, that's the way we all grew up with nations out there. Uh, that wasn't always the case, it gradually occurred over time, but here we are at the end of the ages and that's the predominant governmental structure and that's not going away, okay? There's going to be a major attempt to make the na nation states disappear. And we see that thrust happening right now. There's a great globalist uh, push, uh, but we know that uh, even after Jesus returns, that there will be a great dividing between sheep nations and goat nations. So nations will exist. And I don't know about you, but I'm really rooting for America to be a sheep nation. All right, biblical principles that will be evidenced tonight as we uh, go through this session. Uh, we haven't really talked much about biblical principles. It's going to be a growing part of our uh, series. The first one is called God's principle of individuality. God's principle of individuality is the primary principle of principal approach education. It's, it's the one that sort of is the, the grand umbrella and the big foundation of all the other principles that we talk about, governmental principles in the principal approach. And it's God's principle of individuality. Yes, it applies to us, 
but we have to always begin with God and see uh, how it was fashioned and, and how he uses that principle in our lives. We will talk more about these principles as we go not so much tonight as uh, later in the sessions. The second one, though, that I will identify for you as we go through is the Christian principle of self-government. Now, we talk about self-government. A lot of people talk about self-government. Uh, we're losing that capacity for self-government in our nation, but I still hear it referenced in the, in the news media talking about self-government. Well, the, there's a difference between self-government where it's my willpower, my know-how, my get up and go that is making something happen versus the Christian principle of self-government because self-government happens to be one of the fruit of the Spirit. If you think down through that list, it's uh, talked about uh, self-discipline, okay, or self-control. Well, that's, a, that's definitions for government. And so what we're talking about is the Holy Spirit working in us that empowers us to be able to do all the things. Basically, it's saying making the Lord, Lord of our heart. And then against such things there is no law the things that we will do are going to be pleasing in god's sight and they will not break man's laws either unless they're corrupt laws of course we don't know anything about that but th there are corrupt laws down through history we can see despotic uh, kings and uh, uh, tyrannical forces that can undo some of this but christian self-government propels us forward that's what we train our children to begin to think like that so that who or what is governing in this situation all right this third one is the principle of christian character christian character is one of those very essential ingredients in the sanctification process this is what the holy spirit is helping each one of us grow in christian character that really means to be more and more like christ and so that is a very important founding principle of our nation. And we'll start to look at that tonight a little bit, actually. And then the Judeo-Christian, or what we could say, the biblical form of government. There actually is a biblical form of government. And its roots go all the way down through the early church, the New Testament period, back into the Old Testament. And we will look at that tonight too. So we can say that not all governments are created equally. There is a pattern that God gives us for civil government that works better. Doesn't mean that you know people that are in countries that don't have that biblical undergirding, uh, that they, they can't survive or, or you know they can't make it, they can't be Christians. It just means this pattern is the one that provides the most liberty for individuals. The more liberty we have, the more we are able to advance the gospel in an unhindered manner. All right, a quick review of leading ideas from last week. I probably ought to just give a quiz, but I'll, I'll spare you. We don't have time for that. <laughs> First of all, remember, we spent a good bit of time at the beginning talking about worldview, and we said that worldview affects everything. It's, it shapes everything. It's a reflection of what you believe, and it comes out. It, it, it actually becomes a cause itself for our actions and how we think about things, and, and so that was an important leading idea. The second one was that the providential view of God and history is a biblical idea. It comes straight out of Scripture. We see the providence of God from Genesis to Revelations. Over and over and over again, God caring and superintending his creation and the creatures that he made. And then the third one is there is evidence of this providential view in the founding of America. We see it uh, in the writings, in the actions, in the documents of our nation. They had a providential view. All right, so let's come back to this idea for, of th thinking governmentally again. Here's a chart that I think sums it up very nicely. Thinking governmentally means reasoning with our minds in a biblical fashion. 
And so if you uh, notice that the arrow is going from left to right, the direction that we read and write, not all languages do that, but uh, English does, but we see that we're moving from the internal to the external, like I said at the very beginning. Another way of saying that is we're moving from the spiritual to the natural. It, it begins in the spiritual, and then we see the outworking in the natural. Think of that in our own lives. As Christ grows within us, it has an effect in the natural, in the way we interact with people, what, what we say, what we do. We have the eternal, and then we see it reflected in the temporal. And then finally, we have the from cause to effect, which we already have discussed. So does it make sense to you? Do you see the pattern that we're talking about with thinking governmentally? Can you see the, the trouble that can come if we don't have that linear view of trying to connect the dots? And when we come to a conclusion, can we look back and say, okay, I logically have come from this cause to this effect. If we can do that, if our children can do that, as they're watching various media that they watch nowadays, if they can look at what that person is saying or what is being portrayed in that movie or whatever, and they can think, okay, is that logical? That's a good place to start. Does that, does that make sense? Is that logical? And then the next step, the better step yet, even yet, is does that connect back to the principles of God's Word? Or is, has that gone askew and gone into some humanistic or postmodern idea? And so if we can train our minds to pick those things up, it protects us from fallacies, from lies that are being perpetrated. And many people just swallow, drink the Kool-Aid, as they say, and they, they don't even stop to think, does that make any sense? It feels good, it sounds good, it sounds so, so nice and caring, so it must be good. And uh, that's, we can get in a lot of danger when we allow our feelings to direct us. All right, I, and I do wanna pause, I, I hope I said this last week, but I will say it t tonight. Just because we are doing this live stream doesn't mean that we can't interact here. So if you have questions or comments, something that you know, just, oh, wow, I remember hearing that or reading that, or what about this? Please, just, you know, shout out, and we will have an interaction, and we'll ask the people watching to join us. All right, so human history is Christ, his story. Fulgham, we talked about him last week, a, a pastor back in the 1800s, uh, one of his annual elect election sermons, he said, history is the biography of communities. In another and profounder sense, it is the autobiography of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will and who is graciously timing all events in the interests of his Christ and the kingdom of God on earth. I think that's just such a beautiful statement that he made in that sermon long ago. It's very reflective of the prevailing worldview that took place in that first 200 years or so from the coming of the pilgrims. By the time he made this statement in uh, 1876, when our nation was now kind of 100 years old from the, the Declaration of Independence, we already can see the deterioration that was taking place in general society at that point. But here was uh, a pastor who was hammering the truth and reminding people of uh, the importance of maintaining that belief. Now, this particular chart, I know you can't read it. <laughs> Did I, I? No, I didn't give you this one. Uh, this is a timeline, and I put it up there because I want to talk about timelines for a moment. I can send this to you if you want it. I should have put it in the attachments and uh, forgot. But this is a timeline of the development of civil government over time and it begins you can see back at creation because that's when government first shows up in scripture right after creation and then it goes all the way up to the present 
And we can see that there are dates along there and there, there are lines that come down with words that help describe what was happening there. Now, why have a timeline? Why use timelines? Because timelines are very important here at Dayspring and in principal approach education generally. Timelines serve us well because first of all, they give a big picture, the whole subject you can see you know, very quickly and get the feel for the breadth of it, the scope of it. And so we always start our history courses by looking at a timeline, and often it's the timeline that is in our hall out here. Uh, every classroom has a timeline. I'll show you uh, an example of the timeline in the classrooms in a moment. But this is a different one. This one is skewed just to looking at civil government. So we're going to spend some time, uh, first of all, this evening is looking at the development of civil government over time. And there's so, uh, there are some important things for us to notice there. Of course, that's going to lead right into our understanding of how America came to be and the significance of the government that was established established back in 1776 and, of course, ratified in the Constitution in 1789. So let's begin. The first link, we call them links on a timeline often, and we say the first link is creation. In the beginning, God, and that's very significant because that is the beginning. God determined the beginning, and he was already there, already in existence, and he was there as creator God. There can be no life without someone being the source. So there's that first cause idea. Now, I do want to say that this idea of God in the Bible is very important because the second point here says that the God of the Bible was the God in whom the founders of America believed. So when they're talking about God in there, whatever name they happen to give him, so often it's the deity or uh, the benevolent one or the benevolent being or providence, they're talking about the Judeo-Christian God, the only true God. But we know that there are competing gods and... Uh, they were very clear about what they were uh, supporting and what they believed. And I, we have to keep that in mind as we go through this course. And we understand that Noah Webster, who did the dictionary, he had that understanding of who God was. And we'll see some of his definitions later. The two principles that we can look at in play during uh, this part of history, during that creation period, which goes from the time when Adam and Eve were created up until the flood. That's what we would call the creation period. Uh, God's principle of individuality, certainly, okay? We can look at creation itself, the physical universe, and see the great diversity that is there, right? Look at the stars in the sky, you can actually see differences in them. And if you have one of those things, that I have an app on my iPad that I can hold up uh, to the sky and it'll actually tell me the name of the different stars and you can see the planets. And of course, they actually make them look like they're big and you can see what that planet looks like right in its position. But they all are unique. They're all distinctive. I don't know if you've ever heard of Snowflake Bentley. Does that sound familiar? He lived back in the late 1800s. Snowflake Bentley categorized and he cataloged all the different snowflakes that he came across, thousands. And he would take pictures of them and put them in his notebook and categorize them. And you could see there are books that, that were written by him uh, that did this and not any two were alike. And, of course, that's a great example of God's principle of individuality that e each part of creation is its own. And yet it's also a demonstration of God's diversity, infinite creativity that our God has. So when we see in this room, not one of us looks exactly alike. And it's not just our external appearance, but our character, our personalities are all unique. And 
it's just a wonderful thing that that's how God determined it to be. And so this idea of diversity and uh, getting along with everyone and inclusiveness, that's a biblical idea. Now, how we go about coming there is very different, but it's something that should be a natural outflow of our relationship with God, that we don't exclude others. We don't pin people in a certain category uh, and, and box them into that. But it's just a, a natural, uh, I think it's a wonderful way. The body of Christ is a great uh, microcosm of that principle of individuality. Then we have the other principle in here, self-government. You see, when Adam and Eve were created, God gave them the capacity to govern themselves. He gave them instructions and basically have at it. Adam, you need to name all these animals. And so Adam took that task on and he began to name the animals. Of course, he discovered, hmm, something's missing here. Okay, and that, of course, is how Eve came into being. But this idea, they were given instructions to tend to God's garden and to be able to subdue the earth, take dominion over this vast planet that God had created and extend the boundaries of Eden across the earth, tending that garden, self-government. Of course, we saw last week that sin entered and messed all that up. Uh, Adam and Eve chose the wrong thing. They chose disobedience, and so they lost that capacity for self-government, but we're not without hope. Through Jesus Christ, we're able to uh, have that redeemed. So Adam and Eve were created in God's image for his eternal purposes, and I have some scripture verses here for you. You'll get a copy of this PowerPoint, so you'll be able to uh, go back and, and look up those references. Sin entered every person after Adam and Eve them was corrupted with the sin disease, okay, as Genesis 3 tells us. So in this portion, I want to add that Christian character principle because Christian character played a role. And of course, after sin, Christian character was out of reach and it really became a difficult challenge. And we see various um, people through time where their character shows forth anything but Christ. Okay. All right. Early civilizations after the flood. So we had the big flood because things were so corrupt that God said we're going to start all over. He preserved Noah and his family in the ark. And after the flood, we have three strains of humankind from Noah's seed. Okay, now the curse from Adam's failure is still in effect. Remember that. Even though God wiped out everyone else, Noah still had that seed. His sons still had that seed. And they passed that sin seed or that sin principle, as Scripture, scripture calls it, into their offspring. But we can look at what happened during that time, and on that timeline, you can see the progression. Humanistic civil government was established. We have civilizations beginning to, to group up. Often it was right along rivers. Makes sense that it would be along rivers. There would be a water source, transportation, uh, irrigation if needed, and so forth. So these early civilizations often formed right along there. One of the earliest ones uh, was the, uh, one of the great-grandsons of Noah, Asher, and we had the, or Asher, uh, became the Assyrian people. The Assyrian people also are called the Sumerians, the Akkadians, maybe have heard of those. The Assyrians are still around today, by the way, and uh, we, they play a pretty po prominent role in scripture, don't they? Uh, later in the, the time of the kings in, in Israel. But these, and, and Egypt, of course, down by the Nile was another civilization that grew up. And the one that we know from uh, early in Genesis 
is the one there at Babel, or what became known as Babylon, the Babylonians eventually, uh, that was Nimrod, and they decided that they were going to centralize the government. They were going to try to get as many people, and they were going to be of one mind, and they were going to build a tower and go all the way to heaven just to show how great they were. And, of course, God uh, intervened and said, no, not yet. Okay, I did not plan for a one-world government and therefore he differentiated their languages at Babel and scattered them across the earth. So that was a pretty significant uh, point in our history of the human race. So again, we still see those same principle of individuality, self-government, and Christian character. We can look at Nimrod's character for one. Uh, we can go back and look at Cain's character okay, and, and uh, how it differed from Abel's character and so forth. So those are all studies that we can do. Then the law of God is given to Israel. Okay, we're jumping ahead now uh, in time. And of course, we, we know that he called Abraham out of that uh, Babylonian civilization and set Israel to be an example to the nations. An example of what? Well, an example of God's law and the effect of it ha that it has not only in the spiritual realm, but then also in the natural realm. What I'm doing right now in my devotions, I'm listening to uh, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, and it's just fascinating. I, this is the first time I've done that. I used I, for years have just read, but I thought, oh, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I'm going to try it by listening. I've had to train myself to not let my mind wander, but that happens when I'm reading sometimes too. But anyway, just going through Deuteronomy... It's just been fascinating hearing it. I'm picking up things that I didn't as I read it. Because, you know, you read it and I go, yeah, I read that. I, re I know that already. But I'm hearing it. And it's, it's really interesting to see the pattern of the law and the blessings and curses that God pronounced over Israel at that covenant time uh, and, and how the law was supposed to work. And that if they would just follow his commandments, everything that he said, they were going to have almost like an Eden existence. I mean, it just goes on and on about the wonderful blessings that they will have. But if they transgressed the law, if they didn't keep it in any way and broke it, there were terrible curses that would come upon them. And I, as I was listening, I was thinking down through history at what happened to Israel both in, in biblical times, but also in our modern times, just, you know, the effect that sin had from them breaking the covenant. Uh, the last thing, well, well, let's talk about the tutor part. The, the law was a tutor to point man toward the only solution. Now, God knew from the beginning how that was going to go, and he knew that he was training the human race to get ready for that perfect point in time when he would send the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. Okay. As Israel began to grow and develop, it established under Moses' direction what we call the Hebrew Republic. Now, did you know that there was a Hebrew Republic? It was actually a Republican form of government. Well, let's take a look at it because it's really fascinating and it, it really plays largely into America's founding. God's perfect standard was re revealed and it, was, it is the law. It's a revelation of the state of reality. That's what the law is. It's God's view. It's truth. God's Law is truth. It's the way it is. It's the way God says it is. It's the way he fashioned things to be on heaven, in heaven and on earth. And then we can apply those things to earth. We have the moral law. We have the ceremonial law. We have the judicial or political law that the Jews were to follow, those three things. So the moral law is applicable to all people of all times really isn't just for the Jewish people. These are th commandments that God baked into the uh, universe, into the governmental structure. But then there's the ceremonial law. 
These were all shadows and types of Jesus that the Jews were acting out in faith throughout their history. And they were then fulfilled in Jesus. And then we come to the judicial or political law that was specific and binding to the Jews only. Certain, uh, like, food thing, you know, those kinds of laws. Now, they were specifically for the Jews, and the Jews were required to keep them, but they're also instructive. We can look at those things, and we can glean good things, positive things from them. doesn't mean we have to follow them, but when you look into them, they make sense. A lot of those laws make sense. Some of them don't. We're not Jewish, and we probably don't quite get their context. But this Hebrew republic then that grew up, and this was sometime between 1500 and 300, it just depends on the different dating of people uh, that are working through records and so forth, but that, we'll just leave it at that. It was the first representative republic. Does anybody know how that came about? Do you remember that? Yes, Moses' father-in-law saw how exhausted Moses was. He was like worn out because everybody brought everything to him. And he said, this has got to stop. You've got to divide the labor. You need to set uh, representatives, people who over small, larger, smaller, and smaller groups, uh, and that they'll take care of the things. And then eventually, yes, there might be something that you have to deal with. So that was the first written record we have of representative government. Then we have that those representatives were chosen or elected by the people as judges and rulers. So the people had a say in who they would pick out of their tribes to be in charge. So through history, we see that happening, and they would be engaged as a people to keep that aspect that, that was established under Moses than for them to be able to have representatives over their different size groups. Then we have the external law given as a standard. It became the standard. And when we look at God's law, think of Psalm 19. Psalm 19, the second half of Psalm 19 talks about uh, the law is perfect, the law is good, the law refreshes our soul. That takes a while for us to wrap our heads around because for a lot of people, the law is scary because it's, it's a hard taskmaster and, and we know we don't measure up and I could never do that and, and, and you know, we know the curses that come to, you know, on Israel for not following the law. But when we come to really understand the beauty of God's law, and the law did not change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God's law still stands. But because of Jesus Christ, we no longer look to the law for salvation, but we look to him in faith. He bore that penalty for breaking the law, which I know that you know, but when we start to think of that all in a governmental sense, it helps bring a, a different aspect into play. So the external law was given, and it was the standard, and that's the standard that will forever be because God's law will not change. Not one jot or tittle of his law will pass away. Does that, does that make sense, or am I confused in my muddling things good okay well the law then was interpreted by these judges and prophets who were appointed and then there were civil laws that were based upon God's standard not the majority in other words the people didn't get together and vote to see well we're going to keep that law or we want to add something to this law all of their laws were based on God's standard and had to connect directly to it. So that's the pattern of the Hebrew Republic. Can you see, can you recognize some things from that pattern that are in our form of government? Yes. Well, you'd think it was going so well, <laughs> but we know that it wasn't. Things were kind of unraveling as typical with humans. And Judges ends with every man doing what was right in his own eyes. So things were kind of getting out of whack. 
and the, uh, God was using the Philistines and other uh, neighboring tribes and peoples to try to remind Israel of their commitment to him and so forth. So finally, they got tired of being attacked in this vicious cycle, and they decided they wanted a king, like all the other nations. And, of course, Samuel was deeply offended by that. Uh, but God said, it's okay, Samuel. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their king because that was really the structure. They had their Hebrew Republic. It was a theocratic republic where God was in charge and they followed his prescription. But that's really the divine right of kings was established uh, there because God gave authority to the king. Of course, Israel picked its own king. That didn't work out very well. And so then they went back to God. God gave them the king that he wanted to be in place in King David. Um, but the divine right of kings became a thorn in the flesh for the rest of history. Uh, it still is today in some nations. It certainly was in England at the time of our Declaration of Independence, which we'll be able to look at some of the grievances that were enumerated that justified the colonists saying, you no longer are representing God and his law, and therefore we are separating from you. Self-government was rejected because the more despotic or the more uh, monarch uh, form of government or sometimes it's just a, an outright dictator that comes into play, the less that the individual is able to control his own life. I just heard uh, Sam Sorbo on the radio this afternoon when I was driving in and she made this great statement, I hope I can remember it. The bigger government gets, the smaller the individual gets. And uh, she was referencing what's going on in America today with this government swelling exponentially. And the more that happens, the smaller and smaller the individual gets. In other words, the fewer and fewer rights and liberties the individual has. And the sad part of that is that we get to a place in culture where people choose that over having freedom and liberty to conduct their own lives, to determine their own future, that they would rather have that security, that safety, that provision that some form of government will provide for them. And uh, I, I do believe we are at a tipping point in the United States right now. Uh, but we're not without hope. Um, dominion turned to domination. That's what happened in Israel. Things went very well under David. It was a, a real golden period. And even in Solomon, through most of his reign, it was just a, a time of expansion and peace and God's blessing upon them. But of course, then at the end of Sa uh, Solomon's reign, for being the wisest man on earth, he really seemed pretty stupid there at the end, didn't he? It's just like, why did you do that? Why did you have all those wives and all that stuff? Um, but that's what happened, and then things went downhill very quickly, and the nation divided, and uh, it, it got seriously ugly as time went on, and then those curses began to come into to play after many, many, many warnings and many prophets that were persecuted and even killed. Uh, so they exchange liberty for tyranny. Doesn't make sense. It's not logical, is it? But that's what happened. So then we have this period that we're calling the ascent of the nations or the goyim. Goyim is the, the biblical or the Hebrew term for nations or Gentiles. So the, the nations now that have been forming and coalescing begin to grow and they begin to dominate where Israel was a preeminent nation uh, but as it fell away, it, it got absorbed into the goyim. So I'm only going to look at two uh, civilizations, two empires. Uh, we don't have time to go into all of them. But just Greece had a great impact and Rome had a great impact on the founding of the United States. But I will say that the Hebrew Republic had a greater 
impact. So we have to keep that in mind. Most secular historians, they are always pointing to Greece and Rome and the Enlightenment and, and those kinds of things as, as the, the main uh, uh, sources of American thought. But that when we study, we go back to history, we look at the journals and so forth, we see that is not the case. So Greece had a lot of contributions, but it, it was flawed. Because of the inequality of man, that, that view that they had, that there are certain uh, people that are more privileged than others and so forth, they couldn't get past that. Uh, and then we have Rome. Uh, Rome adopted a lot of Greek thoughts, and, and anybody that they conquered, they kind of like, oh, yeah, I like that idea. Let's bring that in. They were good at doing that. Uh, but they also established Latin, which became a key, important language uh, for us, and also architecture and roads and public works, all very important advances in civilization that we benefit from today. But certainly back at the time of the New Testament, they were crucially important for the advance of the gospel. And so we come to that time in the fullness of time, as Galatians 4.4 4 says, and that's when Jesus Christ came on the scene at that right moment where the world was ready. It was ready for the Savior to come, and it was ready for uh, the good news then to be uh, taken around the world. The reckoning of time changed not immediately. They didn't say, oh, here's Jesus. I guess we're going to change the calendars now, <laughs> obviously. But it wasn't too long, uh, a few hundred years down the road, when time itself, the calendar shifted and became a, a, a cross pointing to Jesus. So we have B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, from the time from the coming of Christ. And that is universal around the globe. Now, some countries, some religions wouldn't say B.C. and A.D. They may call it something else. In fact, even when you go to a museum here in America now, you see B.C.E. and B.C. B.C.E. is before the common era because we daren't mention Christ. And A.D. is now B.C. or no, C.E., common era. <laughs> There we go. Gets really confusing, doesn't it? But the point is, it's still the demarcation of time when the man, the God, put on flesh, separated time. If we had time, I, I was going to read something out of one of these big red books, uh, but we'll have time another night. But I just want, I'm starting to introduce some key principal approach resources for you. Uh, and the, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, when we get into that fourth week. But the, the gospel moved westward. That's what we talk about here in, in Pennsylvania, in the United States of America, because we're tracing the gospel from Jerusalem westward till it gets over here to us. It primarily went westward. That's not to say there weren't missionaries, people that, that went up into India and China and so forth. But the main thrust that we see in, uh, that Jesus instructed of, that they were to start in their home territory, but then they were to branch out and eventually go to the remotest part of the earth. Paul, who took up that missionary mantle, had a dream the man from Macedonia said, come over to us. Paul was actually trying to go eastward up into Asia, and the Holy Spirit said, no, I want you to go westward. And so he went westward. Of course, eventually he got to Rome. We, there are traditions that uh, Joseph of Arimathea went to Great Britain. Uh, someone went to Spain. Uh, so the gospel made its way westward, and as it did, it changed civilization. And I hope to play a little excerpt of some uh, hardcore scientific evidence that we have, uh, research that was done, and statistical analysis done of how cultures change when missionaries, and, and, and it's specifically Protestant missionaries, go into that culture. They can actually identify over years the difference between where the missionaries operated and right across a border where they didn't operate 
and you see the difference even still many years afterwards. So uh, hopefully we'll have time for that because it's a fascinating study, and it's the first time I came across something in our modern day, somebody actually took that on and validated that what we've been saying, that everywhere the Bible goes, civilization flourishes. And we see that, but this was like for skeptics. It's out there. This is the chain of Christianity, and I did give you a copy of this. It's really hard to read, but I wanted to give you a picture of it because this, in essence, is talking about the Great Commission because it's, it shows the gospel beginning in Israel. So you, if you can find Israel, which is part of Asia, <laughs> I don't know if you can find a little tiny Israel in there, but then you can see the chain of Christianity, different links along the way as the gospel made its way westward it made its way over to the united states of course it didn't stop when it got here did it the united states became the greatest missionary nation ever in history and sent the gospel around the world and what we're seeing now is the gospel is flourishing not just flourishing but exploding in latin american countries and in asia so that it's gone full circle. What we see kind of this struggle here in the United States, the whole Western uh, hemisphere, well, Western culture uh, is going through a real rejection of Christianity and truth where the rest of the world is getting it. They are waking up to it. So it's very exciting. And then along the side, it just talks about key pieces of history that happened as as Christianity was adding another link to the chain, now another link and another link. And it's individuals. It's men and women that God used for his purposes. And now we can look back and we can see how he used them. And we use things like that on the timeline to encourage our students that if God used Columbus, and we know Columbus was a colorful character, if he could use Columbus to fulfill part of his purpose in his generation, he can do the same thing for you in your generation, and we challenge him that way. Here's another timeline. This one happens to be going vertically. This shows 10 major links on America's Christian history timeline. This is the timeline, and and it's often in a horizontal fashion that you will see above a chalkboard in every classroom in the school because it gives us pockets to put things in history because we can see, oh, I see how that all fits together. And we're looking at the advance of liberty for the individual over time. And again, every time God's word goes someplace, something happens, something significant happens because it begins internally and once light shines in our hearts, our minds begin to be renewed and transformed. God shines his light. The natural man can't understand things of the spirit, but as Christians, we are given the mind of Christ. And so we begin to understand the workings of God in ways that the natural man can't and tremendous advances uh, happened, uh, inventions and discoveries and so forth, especially during the 14, 15, 1600s, just f- fabulous. Of course, now there's all kinds of things happening, advances, I guess we would call them. <laughs> all right, advancing liberty in the British Isles. So we're now coming to the stepping stone before America. And two people that we're going to take a look at Uh, Patrick of Ireland, just a couple days, what, two days, we're going to be celebrating St. Patrick's Day, which gets a lot of billing here in the United States and in Ireland. Uh, But Patrick uh, was a Christian. He he was not a Catholic, okay? Uh, They have claimed him as St. Patrick, but actually he was a Celtic priest. And I don't mean from the, the Celts before Christ came, but he was part of the Celtic church, that was established in the British Isles very early on, prior to 500, when Catholicism got over to Great Britain, there were already these Celtic churches, and they were all local, self-governing units. They were not collectivized. They weren't centralized with one main leader. 
They had their pastoral care over each congregation, and Patrick was one of those. I'm not going to tell the, the story of Patrick uh, because we don't have time and we're going to move right on. But one thing I do want to point out is Patrick wrote a book called Liber Ex Lege Moisei, and that translates to the book of the law of Moses. So he took primarily from Deuteronomy, wrote a book that outlined the rule of law and self-government as expressed in the Hebrew Republic. And a few hundred years later, Alfred of England, who was a Saxon, living down in Wessex, had a, an advisor present to him Patrick's book. And Alfred read that book and studied that book, and he had consolidated all of the Anglo-Saxon tribes together after many ups and downs. Fascinating, fascinating stories. But he fashioned his newly formed England, the first time it, they were united under the, the name of England or Angleland, and he fashioned it after the Hebrew Republic, which is really interesting because of what we got from that. Here I have a chart that looks at Alfred's Republic with his, what was called the Witten. You can see on two sides of this chart, one side were elected officials, on the other side were a group of unelected officials. On the left-hand side, you, you can see groupings and families of 10, 50, and 100. The tithing men, do you see where it gets 10, where it gets its name? The Villmen for 50 families, the Hundredmen for the 100 families. So there was a person over each of those uh, increasing spheres. And then we come to the Earl who was in charge of this Shire. And the assistant to the Earl was called the Shireef. Does that sound familiar? Sheriff. And then, of course, the last one I have up there was an elected official. It was the king. It was not the divine right of kings. It wasn't just passed automatically onto the son, but the, the Witten had to vote for the king that would take the place of the, the king that had died or was killed. And so then on the other side, on the right-hand side, we just have this one group called the House of Noblemen. These were the noblemen. These were the ones that uh, owned the land and, you know, and had the wealth and so forth and, and, and had the upbringing and so forth. They were not elected. They were part of that. So we had two houses and we have an elected king. Sound familiar? You can see the pattern that came from the Hebrew Republic now into England and then eventually will make its way to the United States of America. So Alfred's contribution, laws based on Mose the Mosaic law and Jesus' golden rule. So he took both, pulled them together into his republic, and Alfred gave us the origin of English common law, trial by jury, and the writ of habeas corpus. They all came from Alfred the Great, who was schooled, in a sense, by Patrick of Ireland, who gleaned the pattern from the Hebrew Republic out of the Old Testament. Thomas Jefferson stated that the Anglo-Saxon laws were the wisest and most perfect ever yet devised by the wit of man. And there was a good reason for that, because they took them directly from God's law and the pattern that he had laid down in Scripture. Uh, Jefferson was really enamored by the Anglo-Saxons uh, because he wanted to put a picture engraved on the back of the uh, national seal of Hengus and Horsa, which were the first two Saxon uh, leaders who came into England and after a great struggle uh, ended up becoming Christians. And so he wanted to do tribute to that Christian beginning that came out of the Anglo-Saxons uh, for the United States. That, he didn't get his way, but it was a nice thought. The Magna Carta then, not too long after Alfred, we come to the Magna Carta. You, I'm sure, are familiar with the Magna Carta. Now we don't have Alfred anymore, but we have John, King John of England, who uh, was pretty tyrannical and kind of uh, prideful and selfish. 
and offended the nobles. So that's what initiated the Magna Carta in 1215. Uh, the Magna Carta codified the civil rights that Alfred had uh, instituted. It made it kind of the law of the land. It advanced the rights or the liberty for the nobles, which did then open the door for more rights to trickle down to uh, the individuals. Uh, the sovereign and the people were equally under the law. That was one of the big takeaways from the Magna Carta, that the law was supreme and it didn't matter whether you were the king or the president, you had to abide by the law. Then we come to Christopher Columbus. Columbus's name means the Christ bearer and that he was. And Christopher Columbus is very uh, maligned uh, in our current culture, uh, and it, he certainly had plenty of problems of his own. But he was a devout Christian. He loved the Lord. And I have a quote here that he talks about how it is that he ended up sailing for what he thought was going to be the West Indies, ended up, of course, discovering America. But he attributes it all to the Holy Spirit, opening his eyes to the Holy Scriptures, and he traces that out. And in his heart was to make it to the West Indies, discover this route, be able to find gold so that he could go and liberate Jerusalem from the infidels. So, and he, he didn't mistreat the Indians. He didn't control his man, men. That was part of the pr problem because some of them did, but Columbus never did. He got along well with the Indians. So there's some wonderful literature that if you're interested in that, I'd be happy to share it with you. That brings us up to the, the Reformation, which is where we're going to end this evening. And the Reformation was really the triumph of the word. Okay, because we had come through this period of time called the Dark Ages as we approached the Middle Ages. And the Dark Ages were called dark because it was dark. It wasn't that they didn't have any light or anything, but it's the light of the gospel was greatly dimmed for the common man. Uh, basically, as the, the Catholic Church, the universal church that had... Uh, gained ascendancy. There were, there were many churches, of course, in the New Testament period that grew up, and some were very influential. One of them happened to be in Rome, which was the center of the empire, and through some various uh, happenings, the Roman church gained preeminence. And the Roman church, once Constantine became a Christian and established Christianity as a legal religion, and then just a, a, a few emperors down the line established Christianity as the official religion of Rome, that changed the Roman Catholic Church tremendously. Because you know the saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and that's what happened to the church suddenly they're in the position of not just uh, ecclesiastical or spiritual matters but they became very entrenched into the civil matters and there was uh, an unholy alliance that took place well and and so the society was dark and the Bible was held in monasteries, and only the priests could read the Bible. The common pr people couldn't read, and so all kinds of things happened. But then we had the, the Reformation that came, and I have a whole list of them starting back with John Lick Wycliffe. Uh, in 1382, he translated portions of the New Testament in English, in the vernacular, the first time that had ever been done. It was always Latin, Latin, Latin. Now the common man could begin to read Scripture for himself. Of course, that accelerated and it grew. The printing press came not long after that in 1455. And the primary reason for the printing press, publish Bibles. And Gutenberg did and those after him did. And the Bibles proliferated into the hands of the people. And so as the people were reading Scripture, as when we come to the time of the pilgrims, it's, uh, William Bradford writes in his journal that the hearts of the people were pricked within them when they recognized their sinful ways because they can now read what Scripture said and that they turned their hearts to God and they sought after the Savior. And that's what started them on their journey that brought them here to these shores and planted the seeds of self-government 
here in North America. So we're going to pick up there next week, and we're going to kind of expand out and look at the uh, founding, colonial and founding periods of the United States up to the time of the Constitution. And then the last week, we're going to bring it all together and uh, try to make sense of it if you're confused. <laughs> Do you have any questions or comments? Is it ringing true to you or is it, is it going from cause to effect? That's really important. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. God bless you. Uh, anybody get their note page all filled out? This one was easier. Yeah, we didn't get there. That's why you don't know the answer. But I bet you could figure it out. Yeah. I bet you already know the answer. You just don't know you do. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you so much.